All right, and welcome back to um, our podcast, Sports Biz, from an agent's perspective. And this is episode number three with your host, uh, Zilam Bekela, or as you know, many people know me, um, my nickname is Chester. Um, that's a nickname with a massive history that, you know, started out as just a, I don't want to say joke, but it just stuck, man. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's a rugby nickname uh, because I, I used to be a rugby player or tried to be a rugby player however you want to put it. And, you know, how the whole name came about, I'm just going to tell you a very short story, don't worry. Um, how that name came about was, this was when we were playing under 11. So we were playing touch rugby with um, a few of our friends. So this is what we used to do uh, before practice. We used to always play touch rugby, which would sometimes turn into tackle, uh, and sometimes it would really get ugly, you know. But luckily, no one ever got hurt. But... Um, yeah, so we were playing touch rugby and one of my friends, um, in fact, two of my friends, Tando, Ngolozana and uh, Ayabule Lakayeki, they just, for some reason, man, started calling me Chester Williams, you know, and we carried on playing touch rugby and they just kept on calling me Chester Williams, Chester Williams, Chester Williams. And yeah, from that day on, man, that nickname stuck. Obviously, it went from Chester Williams to just, you know, to just being plain just Chester, you know, too many ch 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 I just said there. But anyways, yeah, so it went from that to just being plain Chester. And, you know, it just, so it just carried on, man, and it just stuck with me. And teachers started calling me Chester. Uh, and uh, so as I moved up the, you know, you know, classes, uh, every grade I went to, you know, teachers would just address me as Chester, like no one would call me by my given names, Kangilani or Zila. So it was hilarious, man. And it just really stuck with me to the point where if I need to introduce myself, you know, I'm always hesitant of giving my real names. I'm always tempted to just say, ah, my name's Chester. But then I'm always like, that's not your name. That's not your name. Um, so I'm always like, fuck, okay, I've got to use my real name. So that's why I'm trying to always address myself by using my real names. Um, and since I actually became a sports agent, I use mostly my second name, which is uh, Zila. So if anyone, you know, ever meets me on the street, just call me Zila. You know, it's just so much more easier. The, the whole Chester name thing, I left it, you know, with the rugby space. And, you know, I let the late... Um, Chester Williams have his name back you know I borrowed it and used it for a number of years and I just felt yeah it was time to give it back you know to give the guy's name back um, but yeah it was an awesome nickname man <laughs> awesome nickname so um, our topic today um, on this episode three of our podcast is we're actually going to talk about um, loyalty between sports teams and players you know, the athletes. And it's going to be, you know, quite an interesting topic filled with a lot of gray areas. You know, so just, you know, brace yourself because we're really going to, you know, just get the content out and we're going to give the, fa you know, factual information and we're going to sort of like dissect on whether this player made the right call by doing this or not. Okay. All right. And... As always, we focus on the three sports that I'm most passionate about. You know, I don't know about you out there and what sport you're passionate about, but on this podcast, we talk about the sports that I'm passionate about. And I know there's many who love these sports as well, because a lot of the friends I've made within sport, are, you know, will share a similar passion for the sports I'm about to talk about. All right, so let's dive into football as the number one sport to talk about. Now, let's talk about the whole um, loyalty between teams and athletes, you know. And the one that comes to mind as the first sort of uh, point of discussion would obviously be the Lionel Messi and Barcelona uh, affair that went on for a long time, you know. And you got to hand it to Lionel Messi, man, for sticking it out and just being loyal to Barca because I'm sure every transfer window that was approaching, I'm sure teams 
were contacting Messi's agent. I'm sure the guy's phone was blowing off, you know, all um, off season, you know, summer transfer season and probably winter season for every single team, you know, trying to, um, you know, inquire about Messi's contract, contracting, you know, extension um, with Barcelona. Is he going to stay on? Like, if he's going to leave, then where is he going to go? And during every single transfer window, especially in the last maybe three or four years, there's always been that big debate that is Messi now going to leave uh, Barcelona this season, this summer or this winter? And, you know, it's it's really been um, like a point of interest. A lot of football analysts have always been zooming in on the possibilities and, you know, just also discussing that if this player were to leave, where would he go? Because he's such a big brand, like the Messi name is a massive brand. And any team, honestly, that would have signed him, um, they'd definitely be getting not only a marquee player, but they'd also be getting um, a revenue generating machine, you know, because Messi is that big. I mean, if you go on that guy's social media account, I'm not, I mean, the last time I checked out his account, he was at like 60 million, I think, followers, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm sure he's got more now, especially now that he's moved on to another team. So, you know, so let's let's discuss the whole pros and cons of being loyal to a team. You know, obviously, Messi came up the academy of Barcelona. You know, so Barcelona, uh, Barcelona for him was always home, you know. So it made sense that when he signed his first big uh, professional contract it would be with the club because he wanted to reward them for all the resources and finances they put into you know developing him as a player so that's totally you know admirable that he'd want to stay at the club and you know basically make his pro debut as an adult playing for the club the play you know he went on to have an illustrious career an amazing career with Barcelona but you know, where the con comes in all of this is that you look at what the player sometimes has to sacrifice. Because the question that we can all ask ourselves is that with Messi, you know, sacrificing, um, leaving while he was at the pinnacle, like at his peak. Not, not, you know, not to say that he's not playing phenomenal football now, but, you know, a professional athlete is like a product. You know, I know it sounds inhumane and I know it sounds mean, but really, um, a professional athlete, you are a product. You've got a life cycle. There will be a time when you are at your absolute peak, when no one can touch you, where everything that you do turns to gold. You know, Messi now is at the point of he's sort of like at a cruise control sort of place, but he's not at his peak anymore, but he's still playing at a very high level. You know, so the question that I have, and I'm sure the question that a lot of, you know, of the listeners would have is, don't we feel that he sacrificed a lot of money by staying at Barca when he was at his peak? Because I'm sure there was probably a club out there that would have been um, willing to sort of up the, um, you know, the contract offer on his Barcelona contract. But I'm sure with him, it became more about money and it became more about, you know, building a legacy with the club, winning as many championships um, he did with the club, you know, um, and, you know, La Liga titles and everything and just becoming and just helping the club become a giant, you know, within Spanish football, you know, helping Barcelona be labeled as the Catalan giants of um you know, of Spain. And, you know, when you look at it like that, you would say to some extent, yes, he did sacrifice a huge chunk of change. But the chunk of change that he sacrificed, you know, in player contracts, where he would have potentially gotten more money um, in another club that's probably richer than Barcelona, he more than made that up in endorsement deals. You know, so that's how some players look at it. And that's why, you know, as spectators at home, you know, um, how can I say the couch coaches or the people sitting on couches or um, just outside observers, fans, you know, everyone, how they would be looking at it saying, yeah, but you know, he's sacrificing so much at his peak. No one ever takes into consideration that this guy's probably making so much money off the field. He's playing contract doesn't actually 
um, phase him that much, you know. So that's what some players use to leverage um, the loss that they make in playing contract is that you probably find, honestly, that there were so many corporations partnering with Messi in Barcelona where he was more than able to make up for that deficit that, um, you know, he, he lost in playing contract or for the sake of being loyal to his club Barcelona. You know, it's admirable and I give him that. But I do feel that um, another con of staying at a club for too long is that you do hinder your growth. You know, complacency, complacency creeps up, man. And as much as sometimes you never notice it because you're doing so well in your sport, because it's not to say that Messi became complacent where he got fat or he just wasn't performing anymore. No, none of that. You know, he was still banging goals. He was still um, winning awards, championships, you know, while playing for Barcelona um, and for Argentina as well. But I do feel that, you know, complacency can creep in where you just stop growing as an individual. You know, you stop growing. And I think that's where now, even though he was trying to make the moves to try stay at Barcelona, the writing was just on the wall that, nah, even if he was willing to take a massive pay cut, it was just time for him to move on. And I do think at some point, he's going to thank himself that he actually made the move to um, PSG, Paris Saint-Germain. Shout out to PSG, man. They're actually one of the teams I root for um, over in Europe. Uh, because when I was actually playing my rugby in France uh, and lived in Paris, I lived 10 minutes away from Parc des Princes, which is the stadium uh, where Paris Saint-Germain play. 10 minutes away, man. It was, it, it was sick. It was unreal. So that's when I fell in love with PSG and I've just been rooting for them um, ever since. So I really do think Messi made the right move. Mutually beneficial to both parties because PSG landing him was a definite, um, you know, income generation, you know, sort of like um, injection within the club. You know, I mean, the club stock price, I'm sure has skyrocketed, you know, since Messi joined the team. Jersey sales are off, you know, off the chains. And the Jordan brand is actually also doing well. So shout out to Michael Jordan, who's, um, who's definitely getting a, a piece of that pie as well, because, well, PSG is sponsored by the Jordan brand. So, yeah, Messi's move, definitely uh, probably one of the biggest discussions in the offseason. Obviously, alongside um, his nemesis, football nemesis, Cristiano Ronaldo. Um, those two signings were massive. Um, and when you actually look at Cristiano Ronaldo's career, he's actually a guy who's moved around quite a lot. And I think that's how he's been able to sort of maintain, you know, playing at such a high level is because um, he keeps challenging himself. You know, he keeps challenging himself to move to a new team, um, start over and build his legacy back up again. I mean, I know he's returned to Manchester United now, but before he left, he had built up one massive legacy. Left Man U, you know, for Madrid, did super well at Real Madrid, left Madrid, went to Ju uh, Juventus, you know, did extremely well there as well. You know, so this guy was willing to start over and build up legacies with all these different teams. You know, so you got to admire that. So that's where I can say that sometimes moving on to a different club and challenging yourself can be very good for the player's growth. Because um, I believe that you also evolve as a player, you know, because you learn so many different things from so many different players that you start incorporating it into your game. And, you know, it just you end up becoming a well-rounded player. So I think for Ronaldo's sake... Um, it really helped that he did all of that, you know. I'm really all for it. Um, I'm really all for players um, moving on to different clubs. That's the pro of moving on to different clubs. I think the con, when we look at the con of moving around, it would be that um, you never fully like feel settled, you know, with a certain team because, you know, because you're a gypsy. You're here the one day, gone the next. So I think... Um, from a, you know, 
from a stability point of view, it may hinder your stability. Um, and also, you got to remember that these guys are getting older. They've got families now. So uprooting your family and moving to different cities can also be tough on the kids because um, and the wife because they build you build small communities with the wags, you know, wives and girlfriends um, of your, your teammates, other spouses. So you build those communities. And then when you have to leave, you know, that bond is sort of broken, even though, you know, players do stay in touch and they do keep in touch and everything. Uh, that bond is, you know, sort of half broken, you know, so that's the con of the whole moving around. But in terms of growth, I totally support it. And then I think another player that we can look at is Andres Iniesta as well. I mean, Andres Iniesta, he played for Barcelona for many years. And I mean, he's a Spanish legend. And when he made the move to go play in Japan, you know, not only is he changing, um, you know, countries, but you're changing a whole way of life because life out here in the East, man, is totally different to, you know, life out West. So you got to commend um, and clap for Andre Iniesta for making that move, you know, to Japan and coming over and just, you know, performing. He's the highest, pay, uh, you know, highest paid player over here in Japan, you know. The guy nets about 30 million US dollars per season. And rightly so, because he's earned it. He's a phenomenal player. And what's amazing about him is the fact that he is at the back end of his career, but he's playing at such a high level. He's playing at such a high level. And the Japan level is not a level that you could underestimate. You know, it's, it's a pretty high level, you know. Um, and it's, what, it's the highest level in Asia by far. And it's so high in demand. So many Brazilians, so many European players are trying to make the move to Japan to come over and play. And Iniesta has been instrumental in taking the game um, basically out west and really marketing it not only him there's other you know your big european names that have come over to play but he's been front and center like the ambassador of really taking the game global um, in my perspective and yeah man you know i wish andre niesta uh, many more seasons he hasn't hinted anything about retiring yet so i'm excited um to see you know future performances because he really is putting the work in and he's really showing the youngsters how it's done you know so power to him so it's no wonder that he's the highest paid player in the j league in the j1 league all right um okay so now um enough about football you know if we talk about football then you know player loyalty team loyalty <laughs> yeah th th we'd make this one heck of a long podcast so I mean, I try to keep it concise and I try to keep it short so that we discuss um, the various sporting codes and the topic um, so that I don't keep you guys long, you know. Um, I don't want to make this one of those long podcasts. I really don't. All right, so let's move on to uh, rugby. Okay, so let's look at the rugby sphere. So within rugby, we'll start off um, South Africa, you know, where I'm from. You know, there are so many players that, again, you can commend them for the loyalty that they had for teams. But then again, the question is going to creep up that, do I feel that they may have sacrificed um, a huge chunk of change or growth by staying, you know, in one team? And let's have a look at, you know, guys like, Ordon Lungane and um, Loaz Involvo, you know, both phenomenal players who only ever played for the Sharks within South Africa. Mvovo had a brief stint in Japan, so for him, we'll sort of give him like a half-half sort of thing. Because in South Africa, you know, when it comes to Super Rugby and Curry Cup Rugby, Mvovo played for the Sharks only. And there was a time where teams were making a bid for him, but the Sharks were obviously so adamant about keeping him, they had to go on and actually make a bid, um, basically counter and make sure that they're able to retain, like retain the services of, um, of Luazi. You know, and um, 
I mean, Odwa, he played his whole career at the Sharks. He didn't leave. He didn't go play anywhere else but the Sharks. And that's why, you know, he's, he, he's a legend at Kings Park. And it was just so touching when he played his last game that they made a, you know, a tunnel of honor, so to speak, for him because he had been a real servant to Sharks rugby, to KZN rugby and Sharks rugby. So salute to Ukambu, man, you know, the, um, you know he's, he's, he was a stalwart for the Sharks, very consistent and an amazing player. You know, so, but do I feel that he did sacrifice, you know, growth, you know, moving to a new environment and learning from other players? Yes, I do. Because when he also was at his peak, he could have had, you know, overseas stints where he could have really cashed out on his talent, you know, because that's where the the, the double edged sword or the gift and the curse of being loyal to a team comes in is the fact that you do sometimes really sacrifice um, a lot by giving the, the team discounts on your talent because sometimes the team will want to sign certain players and your salary is sometimes cut. And everybody knows that the overseas market, nobody can match them when it comes to really cashing out on players' careers. That's why some players were not willing to compromise. You know, so... That would be my opinion on the whole loyalty thing is that I do feel that um, at his peak, you know, Odwa could have really cashed out and really um, played for a team abroad. It wouldn't have had to be a long stint, you know, just to capitalize on his peak, on his value as a player, you know. But then again, you know, these are my opinions. I mean, guys obviously have other reasons for staying you know, especially once you start having a family um, and children at school, it's not easy to just up and leave. I get that, you know, but again, I'm just, you know, giving my opinion on what I think players sacrifice when they don't leave, you know. All right. So now let's go on to probably South Africa's biggest um, star, you know, in the past decade, which is none other than, you know, Brian Habana. Um, you know, Brian Abena starting out, he spent five explosive, amazing years at the Bulls. And this was the time when Bulls rugby, this was the golden era of Bulls rugby, you know. And if you're someone who lived in Pretoria during those times, you will know how big of a star Habena was. I mean, this was a time, Habena came to the Bulls 2005. I remember I was in the 11th grade at the time. Uh, and we would go watch the games at Loftus, man, and you would hear how the crowd would explode when Brian gets the ball. Like he was, yeah, he he was a big deal in Pretoria. And it was one of those things where you thought that Brian Abana would probably stay um, at the Bulls his whole career. I mean, I was convinced that, you know, he would stay forever because everything... You know, he, he was the king of Pretoria, man. He had everything going for him, you know. But five years later, man, Brian Abana made the decision to move to um, Western Province and the Stormers. Obviously, they probably offered him more and the Bulls were only willing to counter up to a certain point where they were probably relying on the fact that Brian Abana would, um, you know, be, you know, pro probably use the loyalty card on Brian Abana that, okay, Brian... You know, we've been good to you. Don't you want to stay in Pretoria? I mean, um, people love you here and everything. But the guy made the conscious decision to move to the Cape, man. And you have to applaud him for that. Because again, he was moving to a place where he would have to start over. You know, and Vipia fans welcomed him. And he had an amazing, I think he, he spent four years, if I'm not mistaken, in Cape Town. Yes, 2010, well, he spent four seasons, 2010 until 2013, where again, he was brave enough to make the move to France. So Habana is the perfect example of a guy capitalizing on his peak. Because when he moved to, um, to go play in Europe, it's not to say that he was at the back end of his career. He was still playing at a high level. And that's when he decided to cash in on his career because I'm sure Brian was very 
aware of the fact that um, this was probably the best time to earn so much money within such a short space of time because everybody knows contact sports um, like rugby, you know, they could end at any minute, you know. So, you know, kudos to him for making those tough decisions because he had a family um, and I think the, him and his wife had already had their first child as well. So being brave enough to uproot his family, man, and move across the world to Toulon, France, where now it's adjusting to a new language, a new culture, a new way of life. But he knew what the bigger picture was, you know, cashing in on your talent while at your peak. So that's why, man, um, you know, you, you got to give Habana, you know, a round of applause because it couldn't have been an easy decision. You are literally leaving everything you know, your comfort zone. And I'm sure the move to France really helped him grow more as a player and as an individual because his game was elevated to another, you know, just another level. Because while he was playing over there, it's not to say that he stopped playing for South Africa. South Africa was still selecting him because of the value that he was still bringing to the team. You know, so it's really not to say that these guys had been past their prime. I mean, yes, he was past his prime in terms of age, but he was still at his peak. He was still playing phenomenal rugby and he cashed in on that by going to Toulon, you know. So, yeah, so I think that that would be the perfect example of a player that chose him and his family, you know, over the whole loyalty things to teams. Because as much as it's very honorable, it's very admirable when players choose to be loyal to teams, but the number one question that you got to ask yourself when you are choosing this loyalty card is when a team has to make a business decision based on trading you as a player or releasing you, what do you think they're going to choose? I'll let that marinate for a second. (laughs) Because I swear to you, they are not going to choose you. They're always going to look at the team cap space and the bottom line for the team. And if it makes financial sense for the team to let you go, (laughs) Brother or sister, I swear, they're going to let you go, you know. So, yeah, man, the loyalty card, it goes up until a certain point. There are some teams that are loyal to players. And just to go, you know, just to go off tangent, let's look at, you know, um, a sport like American football. And this is the only example I'm going to use in the NFL because, again, I don't want to dive into too many sports because, then it's just going to make the show all over you know it's just going to make the show all over the place let's look at a sport like the NFL where you had uh, Dak Prescott Cowboys player broke his ankle last season everybody expected the Cowboys to probably release him in the off season but they didn't they extended his they gave him um, his max contract which is what they should have given him a year or two ago but they eventually gave him um, the max contract and Dak Prescott came back and he's playing phenomenal football for the Dallas Cowboys. So he's rewarding them for the team being loyal to him. You know, so shout out to Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, man. Um, He really did like a special thing in extending the guy's contract and paying him what he should have paid him a season or two ago. So shout out to that. All right. Coming back to um, coming back to rugby. So again. As we were discussing, um, back to the whole Brian Abana thing. So, yeah, shout out to him, man, for choosing growth and for choosing his uh, family's financial future. And there are other players that have also shown the same type of selfishness, if I'm going to put it like in inverted commas. Because, again, one of my favorite rugby players, Franz Steyn, who had an epic game against New Zealand, did the same thing as well. Franz Steyn has played for so many teams. (laughs) You can... Never keep up with him. You know, he's played for so many teams. You know, from playing for the Sharks, to playing for Racing Metro, to going back to the Sharks, to playing in Japan, to heading back to France and playing for a different team, Montpellier, um, and then leaving France, going back to the Cheetah. So you can see that this is a guy who's always chosen um, growth and his financial future ahead of, you know, loyalty and everything. 
you know. So, yeah, man, shout out to France. And I like that, you know, certain players choose that route or route, um, however you say it, of them first. You know, it's not an easy thing because, you know, team sports are all about sacrifice. They really are all about sacrifice. Where sometimes, you know, you're expected by either your teammates or by front office to sort of make a sacrifice for the greater good of the team. And sometimes that might mean, you know, taking a pay cut or uh, making a certain sacrifice um, in terms of playing time, you know, whatever needs to happen for the greater good of the team. And sometimes, you know, players buy into that, but some players don't. They're just not willing to, you know. Um, so you, you got to respect that. You really have to respect that. You know, I, you know, personally, in my own rugby journey, I chose the growth um, and experiences and, you know, sort of, you know, financial future as well. And what these experiences would do for me in the future over staying in one team, you know, because if it was up to the loyalty card, I promise you, I probably would have stayed and played in Northern Ireland my whole life my whole rugby journey or I would have stayed and played in America or I would have stayed and played in Hong Kong, you know, um, or France. And then I would have never gotten the experience in Japan and probably this podcast would have never existed. So that's how I always count the decisions that I've made is that they've led me to where I am today, you know, and I've got to thank myself for being brave enough to at, at a time where, Team owners of either the semi-pro club I was playing for or the pro club I was playing for were like, listen, we really like having you here. We'd really like it if you stayed long, you know. And I had to make the decision of be of choosing me first. You know, one of the team owners, I'm not going to mention the team <laughs> that I played for, was so upset when I was going to leave that he chased me out of the team's um, apartment that I was staying in. And also when I had moved on to the new destination, when I was playing in France and I'd gone on with my life, you know, he contacted me uh, via Facebook, sent me an inbox. Um, and I mean, I replied because I thought, you know, he, time had passed and I thought we were on good terms. But this guy had actually DM'd me to brag to me about how he had just sold his um, recruitment company, at like a large stake of it. Um to a certain corporation and how the team, you know, his team, the team that I was playing for and the team that he owned was about to win the league and basically rubbing it in my face. Man. But, you know, because I was just raised not to, you know, stoop to that level, you know, I congratulated him for it because I really was happy for them. I thought I had left the team, you know, under good conditions, even though things were starting to turn sour. I made the decision to just, you know, get out of that situation. But clearly, you know, some of these owners, they really take it personal. That's a point that I'm trying to make. Um, To the point where even though you didn't burn the bridge, but there will be hard feelings when you do make that decision, when you do make a selfish decision. So if you're an athlete out there, man, who's not sure, (laughs) you know, about... You know, your playing future, should you stay or should you go? You got to listen to your instincts, man. If you feel like you've done your time in a certain team and it's time to move on, listen to your intuition. It usually is time to move on because the thing that you got to take into consideration is that when it's time for the team to make a decision about keeping you or letting you go and it makes more sense to them financially or logistically, they're going to let you go. They're going to let you go without even flinching. They're going to tell you, thank you for your service, but yeah, you can't, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, you know? So yeah, you you just have to be very, you know, firm, stand firm in that decision and just make it and do what you got to do, you know? All right. And then the last sports I'm going to talk about um, is obviously basketball and, you know, when we look at basketball, we're going to assess two players. Let's, let's assess Kobe Bryant first. I mean, Kobe spent his whole 20-year career playing for the Lakers. You know, for a player like Kobe, 
you could commend that and say that, well, that worked for him because he was constantly looking for ways to keep himself motivated. You know, he's a different breed, man. That whole Mamba menta mentality thing, it's, it's special and it's unique. But a player like Kobe was able to spend his whole career with the Lakers. A player like Jordan as well. Um, let's forget the wizard years. His peak years, he spent them all playing for the Chicago Bulls. You know, so... Players like him and Kobe um, spending, you know, their best years with one team. Um, it could have gone either way, but it, w it ended up working out for them because these guys, these guys were a rare breed, man, because they were really able to keep themselves motivated season after season, even though they had reached a point of, you know, a comfort zone because they're in the city for, you know, a number of years. They're kings of this city. Jordan was the king of Chicago. Kobe was the king of LA, you know, in terms of when it comes to basketball. But every single season, these guys came out like they had a chip on their shoulder. And that is very rare. That doesn't come about every single day, you know. So you got you, you to gotta commend it, man. And you got to um, um, give them a round of applause for being able to pull that off. But that doesn't always work out well for all players. All right. Now let's assess a player like LeBron James. LeBron James, after playing for the Cleveland Cavaliers, what did he do? He moved to Miami, which ended up being a good move for him because from that he was able to grow. You know, financial wise, I'm sure the Cleveland Cavaliers would have opened up cap space. I'm sure they would have chopped, changed and traded guys just to make sure they keep LeBron. But it became more about money for LeBron. He just needed the change, you know, and it ended up working well for him. You know, back to back championships with uh, the Miami Heat joining uh, Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh. Amazing, you know, really amazing. And again, that kind of move ended up working for him because it, um, it was evolutionary for his game as well because you probably find that by the time he went back to Cleveland again, he wasn't the same player. His mentality was also different. And fuck it, let's be honest as well. Who wouldn't want to live in Miami, man? Fuck. <laughs> I mean, Miami's a dream, dude. Flipping hell. If I had a chance to live in Miami, I'd definitely take it. Um, so you can never fault him for choosing uh, that type of lifestyle. You know, because with Miami, I'm sure it also became more about basketball. It became about just the environment. I mean, it's good weather out there. Um, it just feels like you're on an island. Florida in general is just beautiful, you know. All right. And then after um, going back to Cleveland, um, having left Miami, what does he do? He makes another power move all the way to La La Land. Los Angeles, man, city of angels. Again, you can never fault him for that because he needed that growth, you know. And even though um, he moved to LA after his peak years, LeBron is still one of the high perform, you know, high performing athletes within the NBA, you know. So and obviously moving to LA, I'm pretty sure a lot of factors were factoring around his um, his decision to move out there. I'm sure. Um, it was mostly about <clears throat> just um, lifestyle wise and also what he's trying to do off the field. You got to remember, La La Land is Hollywood, baby. You know, it's all Hollywood. And when you look at LeBron's off field hustles, you can see that he's a person that once he's done playing, he's definitely going to move into either the production space um, he can become a movie star. He could probably model if he wanted to. Um, so all of those things are available to him off the field. And LeBron's a smart guy, man. He's, um, like I said in my previous um, episode, that just the way he moves within the league is different. You know, he's superseded, without a doubt, um, Kobe and Michael Jordan when it comes to off the field hustles. I mean, the guy, he gets it in, man. He gets the work in um, off the field. And he's got a very good team that surrounds him as well. You know, from his agent, shout out, you know, uh, Rich Paul. <clears throat> That's actually an agent that I would love to be like. 
and also looking at Maverick Carter, um, his business partner. Like he's got such a good team around him. And when you look at the way they move, you can't help but get excited for the future. You definitely know that when LeBron decides to retire, he's not going to stress about, oh shit, you know, what's next? You know, these guys have been planning for that phase of his life for ages, you know. So for him, moving to places like L.A., it's just been about um, looking at life beyond the game. And also, you know, playing for the Lakers as well. I mean, who wouldn't want to play for the famous Los Angeles Lakers? And now because of all the moves that the Lakers made in the offseason... They've been, you know, tipped or hinted to basically become the Showtime Lakers again. And it's possible, man. Russell Westbrook, Carmelo Anthony in the mix? Fucking hell. I can't wait to see what LA uh, produces in season. Um, And yeah, if they don't win the league, they're a bust. They're a bust. There's no adjustment period. These are all superstars Um, that have been thrust into this team so we expect big results you know but then again just going back to the whole thing about being loyal to team so when you look at LeBron's moves they've definitely helped elevate his game because again he's clearly the type of breed where he needs to be constantly challenging himself and also um, you know growing as a player you know, so yeah, it's 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 exciting times, man. And like I said, this whole topic of you know the whole loyalty thing between teams and athletes, it's an ongoing conversation that's probably gonna go on while we're here and one day when we're not here anymore. Because at the end of the day, guys, and let's never forget this: this is a business. Professional sports and entertainment is a business. Both parties are always, at the end of the day, going to make decisions that best suit them. The loyalty thing can only be stretched to a certain point. All right? And either party should never be mad at one another for making these decisions. And again, that's why we as agents, we are here to always keep the athlete's eyes open that, listen, as much as you love the city, as much as you love the team, you have to consider x y and z you know that's why we as agents are here to keep that objective um, opinion all right um so i really enjoy talking about this topic because like i say when you're a person who's um who's played sports and doesn't matter what level when you've had to make the decision of leaving um you definitely can relate to how difficult it can be You really can. And, you know, I've really enjoyed delivering the content to all you guys, um, to all the listeners out there. Um, Thank you so much. Um, This is, this has been our podcast, Sports Biz, from an agent's perspective, where we don't only talk sports, we lived it. And we continue to live it. All right. So this has been your host from me, Zila, a.k.a. Chester Bekela, and I bid you all a good day. All right. Bye.